So far we've been studying sound in uh, pipes. We've, we haven't considered losses in the, in the pipe. We've considered radiation losses. That's what we did yes, yesterday. Today we want to look at, um, I think it's pretty much for the whole lecture. It's, yeah, for the whole lecture. We're going to be looking, we're going to include the fact that um, there can be energy loss in the pipe. Um, so the way we're going to pro we're going to approach this phenomenologically. We're just going to mathematically put in some attenuation. Um, I'll comment later where it can come from, but um, this approach here of just getting in there. If you want to pursue it physically, you can do that later. We're not going to do that. But um, so this, that's the simplest way to proceed here. And as we've seen, we can do this by letting the wave number become complex with a negative imaginary part. So this is the real part here is two pi over the wavelength. And this is, as we know, is going to end up being the absorption constant here. Uh, now I want to warn you that um, in general, when you get more realistic on this absorption of sound and pipe. This, will, this alpha will, uh, can be frequency dependent, okay? Uh, okay, so what happens here, this is really simple. We have our, here's a right traveling wave, e to the i omega t minus kx, where k is just two pi over the wavelength. We generalize this, we go to, that's what this arrow is supposed to denote here. We're going to now let k become complex, so that's now a bold k. And we write it as the real part here and the imaginary part, k minus i alpha. We substitute that in. The i times the i here gives you a minus alpha x, which we can t take out here and write it like this. So we see that this right traveling wave here, this is a uniform, right, represents a uniform right traveling wave. It's now attenuated and alpha is the absorption coefficient. And incidentally, you can, it, that doesn't mean that it grows, that there's gain when it's left traveling. It also, uh, which would be problems for us, okay? If you, if you do this, um, if you carry this through with a left traveling wave, you'll see that it also attenuates. And, the, and now it's propagating to the left, it'll also attenuate. Okay, so this, this ends up getting, this gets a little complicated. It's interesting, as you'll see. Um, it's very interesting, in fact. Um, and I'll explain that. I'll, we'll go over the, why it is interesting. Um, <clears throat> to investigate it, we, we should, because of it, it's not real simple. <clears throat> we want to focus on pipe losses. We're going to take the simplest possible termination, which is just a rigid termination. So this, of course, what we're doing here can be generalized, right? You can put it all together. Um, we're not, and we're not there yet. We haven't considered realistic drivers, right, to input the uh, driver impedance. We'll do that tomorrow. So you can put it all together. And to, we'll do that to some extent. But to explore the absorption here, pipe losses, we, we just we want to do the simplest case. So we have this um, right now. We have, again, this ideal driver and we have a rigid termination. The rigid termination means that the left traveling amplitude is equal to the right traveling amplitude. Um, and incidentally, it has this simple form here Uh, because we effectively move the origin to the terminating point. Remember? Otherwise, you, it wouldn't be so simple here. That's another advantage that I haven't said. So um, if you look back, you'll see we, can, we have this simple statement because, because of that choice. Um, and you can see it in here. Here it is, the effective, effective moving of the origin. So here's the pressure, the right traveling wave the left traveling wave, and k, that should be a bold k. Yeah, I guess it looks like it is, right? Doesn't it? Okay, okay, good. We set b equal to a, and we have this, 
um, e to the i z plus e to the minus i z is two times the cosine of z in general, where z is a co general complex number. So we can write it like this. There's no, um, gosh, have we seen this before? The first time, have you guys seen a, comp a cosine of a complex argument? It's no big deal, you know. Um, it, it's defined, these cosine you know, trigonometric functions, as, as are the exponential functions, are defined in the complex plane. It's no problem. Now, what we're gonna do next is important, don't, don't miss it. We're going to get rid of this, we're gonna link this to the drive. We're gonna get rid of this amplitude and put it in terms of a drive parameter. This is really important, especially in acoustics, because in acoustics, all the time, we're sweeping frequencies, keeping the uh, drive amplitude constant, as you well know in the, from the lab. So here's what we do. We look at the pressure at the, at the input point, at the drive point, x equals zero, and we know that that's gonna be the force of the drive divided by the area of the pipe, and it's oscillating sinusoidally. So this is our, our drive, our drive here. And linking this to the drive is very important because we're, as I just mentioned, because we're gonna be looking at how things change as we sweep frequent, you know, we imagine various different frequencies keeping F constant. So um, you set X, you do this, do exactly what it says here, set X equals to zero, substitute it into here, solve for A and then substitute the expression back into here, and this is what you get. And you can do, actually you can do it in your head, it's pretty simple. All right, so there's our pressure inside the pipe. Um, now, <coughs> next is the, the input impedance here. We know, what's the input impedance? Well, for a lossless pipe, with a rigid termination, it's this. You can look back and you can see that we, we got this. We got it from the translation, the impedance translation formula. Very useful formula. You may recall, we get this, okay? And you'll notice here something, the resonances occur, vanishing reactants. It, there's no resistance here in this, in this model right here. So we get our usual resonances, okay? Now, we're going to generalize this we let k become complex. So here the k is complex. And we need to be careful because to have a, this has to solve the, wave, the lossy wave equation. The c has to become complex too because omega is equal to ck, right? So we have this. This is going to go to omega is equal to c. We gotta let the c become complex too. So c, and, and the complex c is simply omega over the complex K. So uh, if we don't do this, we won't have a solution to the wave equation. So what did I do? Yeah, so here this, the C has become complex and I've substituted omega over K. So there's our input impedance now. And it's gonna be, it's gonna have a real part and imaginary part, right? No longer, we have, we have dissipation now. So, um, you know, this is going to be in general complex as opposed to just purely imaginary or, or purely reactive there. Okay, now the next part is we typically do this, but if anyone ever gets interested in this, drop by my office. So what am I talking about? I haven't, I haven't told you, but it's happened so many times before. <laughs> we want to take this... Um, this relationship right here and substitute let k become the real k minus i alpha okay and then approximate for weak absorption small alpha alpha much less than k okay weak weak absorption so as usual we're going to we're not going to do the algebra here right but, uh, and I can't remember if I've done it for this or not. I've done it, you know, for a number of derivations in the book, but I, not all of them, I have to admit. But as I said, if anyone ever gets interested in this, please, please let me know, okay? And this is not at all simple. Um, but when you do that, 
we substitute for the, this, and then what we're interested in here is the, the real and the imaginary parts of the input impedance. And one of the reasons we're interested in is that the resonance, we're headed towards resonance here. That's going to be the vanishing of the, of the imaginary part, of the reactance. So anyway, when you beat on this and make these approximations to simplify it, this is what you get. And this is a, a very remarkable expression. And we're going to go through this now and explore it. And in the end, we're going to have a, a, a good understanding, a, a much better understanding of resonance. And it's going to drag in the concept of anti-resonance. Did you guys get that in 3119? I can't remember. Do you remember anti-resonance? I think it comes up in a, earlier in the, in the book, in 3119, OK? But it, no one, I don't think anyone gets it. Okay, but here we're going to actually be able to see what's going on. It's all buried in this formula here. This is, this is uh, deceptively rich, this formula here. There's a lot in there. Okay, but before we do that, the first thing we better do is check it. When there's no absorption, if we set alpha equal to zero, then this is gone and this is gone. And you'll notice here that one of these signs cancels. That's all part of the richness of this expression here. One of these cancels and we get the cotangent of KL minus I, and that's exactly what we, we should get because you remember that's where we started from, right here. So in a lossless pipe, as we've seen before, the first lecture in this chapter, we, we saw this, right? So it checks in that case, I'm just pointing that out. All right, now, so now let's look at this expression and let's look at, um, oh, okay, so resonance is the vanishing of the react reactants. In this case, because there are no losses, it's purely reactive. When this vanishes, okay, we get the cotangent of KL equals zero. It means the cosine of KL equals zero. So we have these <coughs> half integral values of KL, you know, uh, pi over two, three pi over two, et cetera, as we've seen before and we talked about in the first lecture in this chapter. Okay, now let's go back. Now let's look at the, the, more, the result with absorption in here. The first thing you want to notice here, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I keep missing this. Uh, by the way, because we, in this uh, case, where alpha is equal to zero, on resonance, the amplitude will be infinite because we have no uh, dissipation, all right? Okay, so now, finally, let's, let's, let's look at this. This is, remember, this, this is for a weak dissipation. The, because we have dissipation here, we, won't, we've, we will remove this problem. The problem of infinite response on resonance will be removed, right? And we will see that, but you know it's coming. And if you look at this, for resonance, something's happened. Something dramatic has happened here. Resonance is the vanishing of the reactants, right? It's going to be the vanishing of this term. When we have absolutely no dissipation, we have the set of resonances here, cosine of KL equals zero. Now what do we have? All of a sudden, for the slightest amount of absorption, we've doubled the number of resonances. Because look at this, we can have the cosine of KL equal to zero, or we can have the sine of KL equal to zero. So before we had these half integral you know, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2. Now we're going to have pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi because of this. We've doubled the, the number of resonances. Now that doesn't seem right, does it? But in a sense it is right, okay, as we will see. And the bottom line here, where we're headed is that when we've now put in dissipation here, made the system more realistic and we adhere to our <coughs> definition, you know, the proper definition of resonance that the reactance vanishes. We've doubled the number of resonances and what has happened as we will see is that half of them are what we would normally call resonance, the other half are anti-resonance. Anti-resonance is gone. This is a maximum response and a minimum response and they're interleaved in frequency. 
as you increase the frequency. We'll see that. So the key to understanding is the first thing you want to understand, to, to appreciate this, what I just said here, the first thing you want to look at is to consider the input. It turns out you want to look at the input resistance. What the, what the external agent that's driving the pipe sees or feels. Okay, so if we go back and look up here, we're going to have, there's two ways that we can get resonance. We can have this vanish or this vanish, right? So when the cosine vanishes, what happens? Let's look at those, those resonances first. When the cosine is zero, okay, what happens here? Well, this is zero. Oh, this is going to be just one. When the cosine is zero, the sine is one, okay? And then we look at the resistive <coughs> part, and what do we get? We get the alpha upstairs. So the resistance seen by the external agent here is going to be small, relatively small, because we're assuming small alpha, okay? Now, let's switch, before we, we could continue with that, but let's switch over now to the other resonances, the sine of KL equals to zero. Now look what happens. Now this is gone, this is one, and now do you see what happens to the resistive part? Now the alpha is downstairs. So what kind of input resistance do you feel? Huge, it's big, right? What kind of response is that going to lead to? small. These are the anti-resonances, okay? Where these vanish, when you have vanishing, the sign vanishing, you have anti small response. You feel a big input resistance, okay? Now this is all, for, oh, I should say, this is all for a constant F. It's all, it's all buried in here. When we talk about this, we're thinking of a constant drive amplitude. So in one case, when KL is such that this is equal to zero, I feel a very, I feel very weak input resistance. So for this constant force, I'm going to be driving a big, you can think of it as a large displacement. It's going to be a large, it's going to cause a large response because I feel this weak input resistance. On the other hand, when the, the sine is, you're at a frequency where the sine of KL is equal to zero, now you feel this big, very sluggish in input resistance, and so you're not going to get much response. You're not going to get much displacement from your drive here for a constant force. Uh, so here's a summary, to, and this runs into the next page. So we call this resonance. This is going to be where the cosine is equal to zero. So those are half integral multiples of pi, right? And the dimensionless input resistance is alpha L, which is small. Okay, so you're going to you get a big response, actually maximum response. And anti-resonance is the interleaved in frequency or KL, essentially the same thing. They're integral numbers of pi's, and that leads to a big input resistance. So all those words sound good, you know, but what we really need is a graph, right? Now, so this is from the book. Tomorrow we'll, we'll look at graphs that are a little more direct here, okay, to see the effect. But this, this is good right now, I think, okay? So here they are from the book, and what we're doing here on the x-axis is KL, which is essentially frequency. Okay, this dimensionless number KL is essentially the frequency. Um, and you can think of this as we're sweeping, actually sweeping in the laboratory for constant F, and we're looking at the, um, the first, what this is is the dimensionless resistance, input resistance, and here's the dimensionless input reactance. So as we go here, this goes to zero. You can see it going to zero right here. Now, without any absorption, what does this look like? It's going to look like this and just go to infinity here. And then it's going to come, then all of a sudden it jumps down here and goes like this. And this is the typical, you know, elementary acoustics case of uh, resonances in a pipe when you have no loss, right? But the losses here give us a, um, 
the, the, the losses here make this finite. And now, all of a sudden, with the again, with the slightest amount of dissipation, the number of zero crossings here doubles. Instead of just getting them here, okay, we're now getting them here because this curve, this, the curve here comes down. We're getting, them th we're getting it there. So why are these resonances and these anti-resonances? Well, here you look at the input resistance. And this is a beautiful, this beautiful graph here. You can see that when you pass through this resonance, you have actually it's a minimum input resistance. You're going to get a big response. That's what we normally think of as resonance, maximum response. On the other hand, when you hit here, this, you get this spike, fairly sharp for the parameters that they plugged in here. Um, I have some of the values here. Okay, what are they missing? See, no book is perfect, right? Maybe they stated in the text, I don't see what alpha is, right? <laughs> so they should have put that in there. Maybe it's in, the, maybe it's in the text, I don't know. But anyway, this is beautiful representation of, of resonance and anti-resonance. We have a real good feel for it here as we sweep through here. We're going to get, by definition, we get a resonance here because the reactance is vanishing, but the input resistance is very big. So it still is a kind of resonance, and we call it anti-resonance because it's minimum response. What we would like to, what, what, what we're missing here, what we would like to see is the actual response in the tube. Okay, but we'll see that, we'll see a graph of that tomorrow. We'll actually see later on in this lecture. We'll, we'll see a graph. A, a, uh, yeah, but. So we'll be more direct tomorrow. You'll see this. But this, this is good for right now, I think. Now, we can go one step further. It's, this is obvious, but I think it's, it's good for you to see because, um, you know, this stuff is, this, this, our extensive use of impedance is not, is not really easy. A lot of people don't like it. Just don't, they don't like it. I used to not like it because I didn't really know anything about it. I, you know, people would talk to me about impedance, and I'd say, I don't know. But, you know, I'm, after having been through this material a number of times, I'm a believer now. It's really useful. And here, let me remind you, we've seen this before, but it's worth seeing again. We can do one of our overall goals here is to link the drive with the response. That's really a big thing in acoustics. And we can do it here. The, if we look at, for example, here in the case of the power, the power dissipated, or the power absorbed in the pipe, right, due to losses, due to pipe losses. And here's the expression. And as I told you, I never remember this, but I can remember these two things. Analogous to a resistor here, <coughs> we know that this is going to be the power dissipated, where this is now the mechanical and we're thinking of the input power here, which will be the power dissipated in the pipe. This will be the input resistance. This is the velocity of the drive, the velocity amplitude of the drive, right? So how do I, how do I deal with this? Well, I do, in impedance, we're interested in amplitudes here. I'm going to take the, the modulus of this. So the input impedance is going to be just the force divided by the velocity. So for the current here, I substitute the velocity, right? And for the resistance, I simply substitute the input mechanical resistance, and I get this formula. So that's the, that's the power dissipated by the pipe, the average input power, which is the power dissipated in the pipe. And um, we, can evaluate, we can evaluate this on resonance and anti-resonance. Okay, and we've already, you know, we've already done on resonance, the imaginary part vanishes. So you just get, this is just going to be one over the input resistance. We've just analyzed the input resistance, plug that in. And here we get on resonance, we get large power dissipated. So you know the response has to be large. Right, because the, the small quantity is downstairs. And here it's upstairs, and that's the minimum response. That's anti-resonance. OK. 
So any questions about, so that's pipe losses. The next natural thing to do, and we did this yesterday, is well now we, when we have a loss mechanism, all, acous all acousticians think, oh, there's a quality factor, right? It's gonna contribute to the Q, right? So Q is a very useful quantity, especially in acoustics. So let's find the Q, right? So how do we do this? The same way we did yesterday, same idea. We're gonna detune. Here's resonance. Now we're gonna deal with real uh, maximum, not anti-resonance, resonance, okay? This is a typical case, the interesting case here. So this omega n denotes the vanishing of the cosine of KL. It's gonna be those half integral multiples of pi, okay? And here's, in general, we, we detune, we imagine detuning this. How much do we detune? First of all, we're gonna detune a small amount because we have a high Q system here, because we have small losses. So the detuning is gonna be small. How much do we detune here to find the Q? Well, we go to the half power points, right? The three dB down points. So we wanna find this delta omega, and it's gonna be equally spaced on either side of here, such that the power dissipated goes down by a factor of two. And you remember, it's really easy to do that. You just set the reactance equal to the resistance as we discussed yesterday. That's gonna give you the half power points. Um, and so now, um, so we just set this equal to that. That tells us delta omega, and there's a plus or minus. We can find the Q, I don't need to just do that, and here's what we get, there's the Q. Now I want to point, this is not in the notes and I think I need to edit it in. It's tempting here to say, oh, the, the Q goes up with, uh, goes up with K, which means it goes up with frequency. The opposite of, you know, it's tempting to think that here, to, see, to look, to find some physics in here. But I want to remind you, remember where this alpha came from? It came from out of a hat. Okay, we just, we just threw it in mathematically. We haven't discussed, you know, we haven't made this physical yet, that alpha. And it, in general, it can be frequency dependent. So you wanna be careful with this. Don't look at this and think, oh, the Q goes up, and you know, why is it doing that? And while we're at it, for, in a pipe, and I might have mentioned this before in, in the past, um, you're going to have the usual bulk losses that we extensively studied Right? And you're also gonna have wall losses due to viscous scrubbing and thermal, thermal, uh, thermal conduction. You'll have those, those occur in a boundary layer right near the, the wall of the pipe. We did not study those, they are in the book. You can look them up if you ever need to. Okay, typically for a pipe, wall losses dominate. Now it's not gonna be for all, if the pipe has a really huge diameter, eventually this is gonna dominate that. But for typical cases, wall losses overwhelm the bulk losses. And like I said, if you ever do need to deal with this, do what just about everybody else does in the world. You open up KFCS and it's in there, right? <coughs> Incredible amount of inf information. Um, okay, so, We've just left this, alpha is just a mathematical thing. So suppose you're doing an experiment and you, you, you have, have some absorption. What you, what you want, you can run to the theory if you want. Good luck, okay? Most people don't do that. Usually, you're doing sound in a pipe. Usually the dissipation is some secondary effect. You're after something else. So you just wanna deal with the losses as simply as possible. Now, it's not always the case. Sometimes the losses are what might be interesting to you. You might be focusing on, okay? So you definitely do want to get into the theory. But often in experiments, you don't, you don't, you don't care. This. You just want to quantify this alpha. You want to just measure alpha, okay? You could go to some theories and plug the values in, and I'll tell you right now, the alpha will be, the theoretical alpha will be too small, okay? It's almost always the way it works with dissipation. There's gonna be other mechanisms in there I went through all this about 20 years ago. We, had, we did this experiment. We had this long pipe in the basement. It's since been removed when the building got renovated. They, they had to remove it. So 
But anyway, we had this long pipe with a really nice absorber at one end. It was actually a nonlinear acoustics experiment, okay? But um, we had to deal with pipe losses. We had to quantify it, all right? So I opened up KFCS. Oh, I hadn't taught any acoustics at that point. I, but, you know, I knew about KFCS. So I opened it up, started reading about this stuff, and I said, well, went back to the experiment, closed the book, went back to the, never, didn't open the book again for years. Okay, well, no, that's, that's, that's actually not true. But we, we measured it. We just wanted to measure it. We just needed a value, and we wanted it to be for our experiment, and we needed a value, okay? I did actually, I, I remember now, I did compare to the wall losses in KFCS, and we were, they were 10% down from, we were, we had 10% greater losses. Okay, which, you know, that's okay. And we finally, what we think that there, we never did nail it down, but um, one thing is, even though it was a thick aluminum pipe, you could hear the sound. The sound was coming out. All right, well, that's radiation, right? Probably, that doesn't, probably wouldn't account for the 10%, but it's, it contributes. But the other thing is, this thing was 20 meters long. Do you think we had a single aluminum pipe 20 meters long? No, we had junctions. We had to be really careful with these junctions. They, were they had to be machined very properly. But we noticed that you know, acoustics is a great probe, right? Ultrasound, just think ultrasound. Um, we noticed that there were, I think we actually observed or we inferred, I can't remember, reflections off the junctions here, even though this was machined down to a couple thousandths of an inch. So the fact that there wasn't a perfect alignment there, and maybe there was, even though they're pressed up against a little bit of a gap there, um, that's probably where that 10% came from, okay? But in the end, we just needed, an, we needed an accurate value for our apparatus to carry on with this, to get into the nonlinear acoustics that we were interested in. So here's what you can do. It's pretty obvious. Um, you, can, you, can do a you can drive a standing wave if you have a typically smaller pipe. You can drive a standing wave, look at the resonance peak, and you know, go to the 3 dB down points, get the Q. From the Q, you can get the absorption coefficient. All right. You can also excite the mode, turn off the drive, and look at the mode decay. Why would somebody do that? So you look at the, at the, pressure, you know, at the pressure amplitude as a function of time. It's a, it's a damped oscillator. You have, a, you, know, a, you have a standing wave, which is an oscillator, and you watch it decay. And you can, you, know, you can do a number on this. You can look at the logarithm. You can take the amplitude, look at the log, logarithm, and the, the slope will give you the absorption. I actually had to do that for some research once. It was appropriate. I don't want to get into that. You don't want me to get into it. But I, I, we actually used that to find the cues. Um, in the case of a long pipe, typically what people do is they use traveling waves. So you send a traveling wave down there, and you can watch it decay, e to the minus alpha x, right? But there's a problem. What's the problem? Here I am driving this pipe, long pipe, and I'm pushing, pushing this equipment rack along the hallway, <laughs> connecting up microphones at different points. What's the problem? Do you get a nice clean? What about the termination? you're gonna get some reflections, okay? So that could muck up, that could cause trouble. You're not gonna get this pure attenuating wave. This is not, would be in space now, okay? So how do you get around that? Anyone got any ideas? Well, you can, you can do this. You can put in, standard way is to not put in a continuous wave, but put in a wave packet like this. And then as long as you take the data before the wave packet bounces off the end and comes back, you're going to be fine. So you, 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 you repeat this, right, with some dead time here. And you just make sure you're measuring, that you're not interfered with, with, the, with the return. That's a standard thing to do. Um, all right, now, 
What we're going to talk about is a different way, an indirect way, that comes from our theory here that's interesting. And it's useful to know about. I'm sure somebody's used it before. Okay, it's indirect. So that's why I think a lot of experimentalists, I would just shy away from this. And I might have seen it way back then, 20 years ago, but, you know, I, I don't want to, we want to, we needed to get this alpha precisely so we could move on and get where we wanted to go. Okay, I don't want to make assumptions, do something indirect, because I'm worried that it's, it's, it's not going to be quite right, okay? So you want to make a direct measurement. But this is an indirect way, that's, and it's really interesting, as I'll try to convince you. So here's, here's the idea. Um, here's our, remember, this is the pressure in the pipe. You may remember this. It's got this boundary condition here at x equals L. We have a hard, we're assuming back to a hard termination, right? This P0 here now, I, with, this has been slightly changed from the pre previously. This P0 here is really a P sub L, but KFCS call it P sub 0. They shouldn't have done that. Because 0 we use for the input point, right? But this is the pressure at the, term, at the rigid termination here, this P0. I don't want to change the notation because we're going to be looking at KFCS graph, a graph. So I think we better stick with their notation. But they really should have called this P sub capital L. Now, here's the idea. What does the pressure look like in the pipe? Oh, well, we, we didn't really, we didn't, haven't done that yet, right? So, remember, this is complex K. You substitute the complex K in there into this expression, okay, and assume weak absorption. And with uh, some complex algebra, this is what you get. All right, what does this look like? It looks like this. So, this is the... This is the pressure in the pipe. The pipe is down here, okay, in the, is a coordinate. And this is the pressure compared to the maximum pressure at the termination, at the rigid termination. Okay, this P0, which should be PL. Now they've done something here for convenience. What, where's the end of the pipe? Well, first you think, well, you, you know, we've been always, we always drive it here and the end is there, right? Well, it's switched now, you can see it right here. So the origin, the input point, is now here. This is the rigid termination. And you'll see why in a minute. You can already see, it's the dashed line here. So when you um, plot that, here's what it looks like. And um, it looks complicated, right? So what's going on there? Well, we can, we can actually understand this physically. All right, so remember, um, here's, here's the drive. So the wave is coming in here and it's bouncing off here. You'll notice here that the, um, the standing wave ratio is now a function of where you are in the pipe, right? Close to the end here, we get a nice big standing wave ratio. And the reason is the um, the sound here is coming from the direct wave and the reflected wave. It's a, su it's a superposition of the direct wave and the wave reflected off the end there. And there's no time for, the, for them to get out of phase. There's no losses at the rigid end. So we essentially have, and when you get real close here, we've got perfect constructive interference. So we have like a normal, locally, it's like a normal a lossless standing wave. So we get a big standing wave ratio here, but not true over here. You can see we get a definitely finite standing wave ratio. So here's what's happening. Um, let's look at the maximum first. What do, you, what do you see? When you look at the maximums, what, do you, what strikes you? Yeah, I, was a, I, was, I think that's normally what students would say. <laughs> okay, it's experience that tells you, no, there are pro you're looking on the, the bad side. You've got to look on the good side of things. It's approximately constant. The amplitude is approximately constant. Well, that's a good thing, okay? That's something we should be able to get a feel for. We can, uh, can we try to understand it. Can we understand it? Well, yeah, here's, we can. So here's the idea. We, again, we have this direct wave, the wave coming in here. It's, it's attenuating. So 
if we look at the, you know, the pressure amplitude here, and ah, this is, okay, I'm going to put this L minus X. Okay, so this wave is coming in. It's going to be attenuating, right? So if I look at its amplitude, the pressure amplitude here is going to be exponentially attenuating, like, attenuating like this. So this is the wave coming this way. It bounces off. What does it do? It just keeps attenuating. Right? So if we look at a maximum here, what's happening at a maximum here at one point is we're adding these two. And you can see right away, qualitatively, that as I go along here and add the two, what's going to tend to happen? It's going to tend to be constant, right? And in fact, the theory shows us that. And the theory actually quantifies how constant it is. It's, to order alpha, it's a constant. It's, this difference here, the fact that the amplitude is not constant, is of order alpha squared, or alpha L. So alpha L is a small quantity. So when you square that, you know, it becomes very small. So that, that's, what's, that's what's happening here. That's for the maxes, for the constructive interference. What about the destructive interference? Well, that's a little harder to see, but now instead of adding these two, we're taking the difference. So we're now, uh, now enhancing this. We're now enhancing the difference, right? So what happens is, as you go down here, you get, it's, it's going down. And it goes down linearly to order alpha for small alpha. And you can see that in here. Where do the, um, where do the, oh, let's go back. Where do the maximums occur approximately when this is equal to one, right? Why is it approximate? Because of that X right there. Remember your differential calculus? So if we wanted to find the maximums here, we take the derivative, set, uh, extremums, we take the derivative, set it equal to zero. This is going to, it's not going to be just where this is equal to one and that's equal to zero. This is going to, change it, it's going to shift it, okay? But we've got an alpha squared here. So to order alpha, the maximums are where this is equal to one, and they're constant, just as we sort of qualitatively saw there, okay? What about the minimums? So the minimums approximately occur when this is zero, this is one, and now take the square root, you can see that they, it's going to be a straight line. So now you know the whole idea. The whole idea is we can get, by me taking measurements with a traveling microphone, right? So now the micro, <laughs> so the micro, here's the termination. You got this little tube, long lead, wire leads. You, you scan this microphone in here to generate this. You draw the best fit straight line. This should be a straight line for weak absorption. You draw this, you find the best fit slope. And then you set it equal to the theoretical value, and you solve for alpha. So this, act, this is a way of determining the absorption coefficient. It's very indirect, right? <laughs> OK. But I'm sure somebody's used it. I'm, I'm sure. Um, you know, this traveling, wave, the traveling microphone was, a, was very <coughs> popular for a long time. With microelectronic revolution, it's kind of less now. You know, like I told you, there's, you can actually You can do some or perhaps all of this with just actually a two-point measurement. You don't really need a traveling microphone. Remember I told you about that? This, this, the great story that it's a, it's a Professor Baker story. He was the one who supervised the thesis. Goes through all this trouble, and then it was never implemented. It was implemented. It was done once. The experiment was done once. So it, remember the the idea is, and I and I. I I think, it, I suspect it would carry over to this, to the dissipation. But the idea was when we were talking about um, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, where we had no losses in the pipe, and you had this traveling microphone, you, you measure the standing wave ratio, and you also measured the, the distance to the first minimum. 
how somebody discovered that uh, with going through a lot of math, you could, with just a two-point measurement, and you can put those, I think those microphones anywhere in there. I don't know, there must be some restrictions on this, but just with a two-point measurement, you can get all that information out, which is usually, you want to find the impedance of the termination, like, you know, this acoustic tile, right? So it probably carries over here. So we had that experiment, as I told you, we had that exper old B and K apparatus, as I told you, and it didn't work real well. And then this, with this new method, um, it was turned into an experiment. It was done once, one group of students, and we abandoned it. Because all the students were doing was hitting enter. And all, it had to be all automated, it was so complicated. So, <laughs> great story though, I think. I love that story, you can tell. <laughs> told it twice. Two days. Okay. Anyway, um, all right. Okay. We've been through that. Let me see if I have any changes here. Or comments. Okay. So, getting back to this, with your traveling microphone, you find this. Uh, the slope, and you can find alpha. Alpha will be the slope divided by 2L. So this is, uh, it's, it's interesting, and it works, and I'm sure people have used it. But again, I want to remind you, you want to be um, real careful when you do this. You know, this, this can take a lot more time than just a direct measurement. And you may always be worried that there could be some mistake in here. So most people, you know, unless you're very much interested in the absorption losses here, um, you know, if, you're, if that's what you're after, you probably want to look at the absorption from different perspectives. Make sure everything is consistent, right? And you're certainly going to learn something there because it's not going to be consistent, I'll tell you right now. There's going to be errors, and you can learn from that. But if the absorption is secondary in the experiment, as it often is, you know, I think I, this is what I would do, okay? But this is an, an interesting alternative, and I'm sure it has uses. Um, okay, so um, tomorrow is the actually tomorrow's the last lecture of the course. That, yeah, I think right, isn't it? Well, okay, it is and it isn't. Tomorrow we're going to finish what we're, this part of the pipe, acoustics and pipes, okay? And now we're going to put everything together. And there's some interesting surprises here, okay? So we're going to look at the system as a whole, which you really have to do to, get to, uh, to be correct here. We'll, be, we'll, be, we'll put in a realistic driver, all right? Um, and then Thursday is basically a lecture for the final experiment. It's a lecture on um, modes of a, acoustic modes in a box, okay, or a, a cavity. So, and then Monday is the problems, right? Okay, and, and the lab is this week, it's Thursday, right? All right. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? And then there will yeah. be one more quiz next week? Yes. So after the... Discuss, problem discussion on Monday. I'll send out the quiz. Now, I will probably make that due Friday, not one week, because we won't be meeting, so I feel I can do that, you know, give, so it should be okay. You'll also be writing up a lab, I'll give more time on the lab report, but, but I think I'll probably, just to try to get this quarter over with, it'll probably be due at the end of the week, Friday. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, thanks.